look, um, we I think we'll get underway uh, just with some uh, some initial uh, material that we need to get through. Uh, first of all, apologies, um, none received, and we're just trying to get our our two other members uh, on the line, one way or the other. Um, so, declaration of interest. Is there any any member or councillor that needs to declare an interest for today's meeting? Thank you. Uh, confirmation of minutes. We have one set of minutes from the 9th of April, uh, and uh, I'll move that we accept that. Do I have a seconder, please? Seconded, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Carried. Um, just uh, before we, we move through the rest of the agenda, uh, to note um, three points, uh, I think, at the start of the meeting. Uh, Saturday, of course, is Anzac Day, uh, and an important day uh, for all of us as we commemorate those who uh, gave their lives and those who served their country. Um, for the first time since uh, 1916, we won't be doing that as all of us on this call would normally be doing it uh, at a cenotaph uh, with our local communities uh, and acknowledging uh, and honouring uh, our past servicemen and women uh, and our, our current service personnel. Um, but we have set out a, a number of things that we are doing around the city, from uh, lighting up the, the Harbour Bridge, the War Memorial uh, Museum, uh, the, the Sky Tower, of course, uh, and the Light Path. Um, there is also uh, a move for uh, a standing at dawn uh, and uh, maybe listening to it on the radio or the television as the, uh, as the, as the acknowledgements of uh, Anzac Day play, take place uh, through the media. And I would certainly encourage people to do that and uh, encourage, I suppose, all of us when we think that we're finding it tough with lockdown and various other things to remember the sacrifice of, of past generations, uh, which is much greater than our current generation uh, generations have been called upon to make. Um, secondly, uh, I would just like to acknowledge that um, we've made some remarkable progress uh, in our battle against COVID-19, and to have the lowest rate of transmission, I think, in the world, that less than half a percent, um, a fifth of that of the average across the world, uh, shows you how far we as a community uh, and with good governance have come. And I think we should acknowledge that and acknowledge the progress we're making uh, as we look forward to uh, at least a, an initial step back to, to Level 3 uh, next Tuesday. Um, thirdly, I'd, I'd like to put on record um, a big thanks uh, to our Chief Executive Officer, uh, our Executive Leadership Team, uh, our um, Chairs and Boards of our CCOs and the Executive uh, CEOs and Executive Leadership Teams of those boards all of which have volunteered to take a significant cut in their salary, um, uh, matching what I know a lot of councillors uh, are doing. Uh, but that was done uh, entirely uh, on their own initiative, without pressure from me or anybody else. Uh, but it confirms to waka eka noa that we're all in this together and that all of us are prepared to make what sacrifices we can, acknowledging the hardship that will be created for some in our community. And I just want publicly to acknowledge those that work professionally for us and those that serve us on the boards uh, of the CCOs uh, for taking the action uh, that they have taken. Um, we come now to petitions. There are no petitions. And item number five, public input, I have received three requests. Uh, one was declined uh, in regard to damage from traffic vibration on the basis that this, uh, this uh, issue falls under Auckland Transport, uh, who will respond to that issue. I have a withdrawn request from the Arts Council of New Zealand and an, a, a request that I have accepted which is from the Auckland Regional Amenities Board. Um, I spent some time on the phone uh, yesterday and the day before to uh, our uh, ARAFA uh, funding board and the Regional Amenity Board members. 
uh, and I want, before inviting Matt and Barbara to speak, uh, to acknowledge their cooperation and their support um, for Council as we seek to tackle the challenge of finding some hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in lost revenue, which means that we cannot spend in the coming financial year uh, what we would like to have spent and what we were planning to spend. So if I can uh, just check, first of all, uh, Matt and Barb, are, are you both on the line? Morena, yes. Morena, yes, I am too. Great. Uh, well, thank, thank you to, to both of you, and I'm not sure how you might want to divide up the five minutes between you, um, but uh, uh, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, there'll be five minutes for the presentation of your submission, uh, and then maybe up to three questions from, from councillors if required. Um, and I just need to advise councillors before inviting you to start. Um, Feso uh, Collins is now on the line, and Wayne uh, should be on the line by phone now. So uh, I think we, we have everybody here. So thank you very much, Phil, for your efforts there. Uh, Matt and Barb, uh, the floor is yours. Ark Maria, elected members and council officers, thank you for the time today. Uh, the collective amenities funded under the Auckland Regional Funding Act. And I'll continue. Matt, um, we're having trouble hearing. Can I suggest maybe you turn your video off and uh, see if, if that works for you? How's that coming through now? That's much better. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for the time today. The collective amenities funded under the Auckland Regional Amenities Funding Act would like to take the opportunity to update funders on our continued delivery of services, impact and outcomes during these imperfect times. Like many organisations, the impact of COVID-19 has hit hard, imposing complete revisions of current plans and operations and halting the delivery of outcomes and events many have spent years working on. In concert with these operational challenges has come the need to reorientate our financial direction with key funders, funding sources and entire funding models rendered OTOs. Current reserves, which have historically been critical, now being vital to the ongoing core operations in this volatile funding environment. These are not unique challenges, however, and many years of prudent business planning, adept analysis of current and short-term changes, and an agile response by amenities and their governors have ensured respect and resilient and still able to deliver impact in the imperfect near term. What remains at certain times is our continued importance to the lives of all Aucklanders and we have each been provided a unique opportunity as amenities and a privileged opportunity or catalyst to engage with Auckland at a personal level in their homes, continuing to support and enrich their lives at a time when it is most appreciated and needed. This has meant significant pivots by the amenities to advance or create digital strategies and engagements that will continue to serve us well into the future and a proven capacity to reach literally hundreds of thousands of Aucklanders despite COVID-19 Level 4 and Level 3 restrictions. This is a success in itself and continues to show how determined we are to continue to remain accessible, relevant and vibrant to our cities, our city and to ensure Aretha levied funds continue to be well utilised, improving Auckland and the lives of its respective communities. The amenities are all so different and the pandemic has affected us all in different ways. But for all of us who have audiences as such, we've been really heartened by the warmth of response and the depth of engagement from people far and wide. As one example of how APO has increased its digital reach during this time to compensate for the fact that we've been unable to be in the concert hall, we've been restreaming previous performances We've had musicians recording themselves in their living rooms, for, forming virtual ensembles with colleagues across the city and making programs to keep the kids entertained, making instruments, interacting with puppets to learn about music and much more. Unbelievably, well, it was unbelievable to us, but we've checked it and it's true. We've reached over almost 800,000 in Auckland and globally, and that's just in the last four weeks. I know my colleagues at the Opera, the Arts Festival and ATC are similarly working hard to do as much as, digital, as much as possible in the digital space and stay connected. 
What the pandemic has shown us above all is that the amenities are reaching into the hearts of Aucklanders. If ever we needed proof of our relevance, COVID-19 has given us that at least. We really appreciate Council's consideration to keep letting us make a positive difference to people's quality of life and wellbeing. And again, we, especially at the moment, we really couldn't be doing it without you. So thank you very much to all of you for your consideration. Uh, thank you very much, both Matt and Barb, uh, for that introduction. But more widely, thank you for the services and the richness that, that all of you impart uh, to, to Auckland uh, as, a, as a city and a community. Uh, we, we absolutely acknowledge uh, the, uh, the work that you do. And we acknowledge, Barb, in particular, that um, I know in, in previous uh, presentations you've indicated that your members are, are skilled performers uh, but paid at a very low level. We hope to be able to address that this year, but because of the change in circumstances, we haven't been able to. Uh, and to congratulate you for 800,000 as a digital audience over four weeks, uh, that's a fantastic achievement. Um, right, so I'll open it up for questions. Uh, so uh, any councillor that has a question of Matt or Barb or both, um, please indicate to me. Yes, Mr Chair, Linda Cooper. Linda, first Thank question. You. Thank you, and I would just want to acknowledge Matt and Barbara and the work you've been doing in the community. Um, my question is for Matt. Um, because as we come into level three, people will be allowed to swim again. And even though it's getting colder, people have been hanging out to do that. Are you? I, I look at the amount that you will increase your get, 120,000, which seems a very small amount compared to a lot of the other amenities. Is that going to? Are you going to have the capability and capacity um, to do that um, once we go into level three? Look, that's a really salient point, Councillor Cooper. On the proposal from Council, which we have accepted, there will actually be no increase to funding. So we will have the same amount of funding as last year, which look, we're very pleased with in this environment, but there will be no increase. That's forcing us to now rely on more on our reserves, as Class 4 funding has also reduced and other gaming partners. And we will really be focusing on what core business looks like for us this year, how to continue serving our membership and our clubs, how to continue uh, being agile in our response to life-saving services in a COVID environment where lifeguards now cannot cohabitate at a surf club or stay at a surf club, where we know more people will be using the beach as local domestic tourism increases. So we're really going to be pushed to do more with less, but uh, it, it's a challenge we're up for. Uh, we've been through 100 years as an organisation, world wars, pandemics and depressions before, so we believe with our continued support of council and the volunteers, we'll rise to the challenge. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to your volunteers. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt, and I'll join uh, Linda in thanking you for the work that your organisation and uh, members and volunteers do. Uh, are there further questions from councillors? Yeah, I've got a question, Phil. Uh, Councillor Casey, Cathy Casey. Yep, uh, go ahead, Cathy. Barbara, of that 800,000, how many of those were children? Uh, Morena, Cathy, it's it's very it's difficult to tell. We have got breakdowns by programs. I don't have them at my fingertip, but several thousand of them are children looking at our um, our puppet shows and learning about how to make an instrument out of you know shakers with rice and bits of old toilet roll and all the, the things that people have abundantly in their homes at the moment. So oh yeah, it is a good spread. There's been a huge take up of our restre our restreams that we're doing of our concerts, but equally a very a very satisfying and very satisfactory in, in um, engagement that's I think much more local actually rather than international with our with our children's programs. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Barb. Uh, are there any further questions? Room for one more question, if there is one. If not, um, I will move and ask for a seconder. I'll second, uh, Your Worship. Thank you. That's, sorry. Um, Desley. Desley. Um, so moved, uh, uh, Phil Goff, seconded Desley Simpson, that we thank um, both Barb and Matt for their attendance and their uh, public input, which we have received. Uh, and I think, uh, while it's not formally in the resolution, to thank both of you more widely and the other members of the Amenities Board um, for 
your service on behalf of the, the whole community of our city. Um, I'll put that resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 <coughs> to the contrary, aye. to the contrary, no. Uh, I'll declare that carried unanimously. Um, thank you very much, Matt and Barb, and thank you for making yourselves uh, available today. Uh, we come now to local board input. Um, there, are, there is no <coughs> local board input. Um, and then item number seven, uh, extraordinary items. Uh, I think councillors have been advised that there is an extraordinary um, item, and I will move and perhaps ask uh, Sharon Stewart to second um, the resolution that we consider as an extraordinary item, the appointment of a group recovery manager, COVID-19, and we'll have that discussion at item 12. Um, the reason that it's not on the agenda is because the need to appoint to this position was identified after the agenda was made publicly available, and secondly, um, why we wouldn't want to delay this is because uh, we are rapidly evolving through um, the, the COVID-19 uh, response uh, coming down to, to, to level three. Uh, and while still dealing with the emergency, uh, looking forward to the recovery. Um, if there's any comment, I, I won't do a roll call on this. I think it's, um, it's pretty straightforward, but if there's uh, any um, uh, um, any comment before it, or I'll, I'll simply put the, the vote, I think, and we'll have the discussion under the extraordinary item. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, aye. no. Carried. Thank you very much for that. Um, item number eight is our COVID-19 briefing and the Auckland Emergency Management status uh, up uh, date. But uh, before inviting uh, Ian Maxwell and Kate Crawford to speak to this item, um, I think I've got uh, Ravin Jadaram, uh, Chief Executive of Watercare, on the line. Ravin, are you there? I am. Thank you, uh, Mayor Goff. Uh, and thank you for uh, responding to our invitation to talk to us today. Um, uh, it's cloudy outside, but it doesn't rain as much as it needs to. Uh, we know that the situation has been... Um, Pretty bad this year, I think, with January and February, the driest ever months on record in Auckland. So um, I'd appreciate an update uh, from you, please, on the water shortage situation and uh, the planned move, uh, if required, um, over the, the next few weeks um, to maybe stage one of a mandatory restriction situation. Uh, Ravine, so could I invite you to address uh, the emergency meeting, please? Sure, thank you. Good morning, councillors. Uh, as you're all aware, we are actually in a drought, a quite a severe drought. The challenge with droughts is we don't know how severe it is until it's finished. But uh, the advice I'm getting from Met Services and my staff is that we are probably looking at something that is beyond one in 100-year drought, if not close to a one in 1,000-year drought. So it would be interesting. We, we are taking this seriously as we need to. Um, so far this calendar year, we've received less than half the rainfall that we would have expected. In the first two months, we only received 35% of the rain. We started the year with a uh, lower than normal storage level because 2019 was a dry year as well. We had some rain after August, but the first six months of 2019 were the driest on record for Auckland. So the situation uh, as of today is our lake levels are just over 48% full. It's 48.3%. Uh, demand has fallen close to about 420 million litres a day, which is good. But yesterday it shot up to 450 million litres again. We suspect... It was slightly dry and sunny yesterday, but also some businesses must be getting ready to open, so they must have been cleaning, etc. In terms of uh, the storage level, we are in what we would call level one restriction zone. This is where in the, um, the Auckland Council bylaw, we would have gone out and said we are formally in a restriction. But because we've got COVID-19 and restrictions require staff to go and talk to customers who are not abiding by the bylaw, 
and we're trying to keep the physical distance, we have over the past maybe eight weeks been focusing on voluntary messaging. And we've just done a survey in the last few days, and the survey of about 500 Aucklanders shows there is high recognition that we are in a drought, and a lot of the Aucklanders are reducing their water demand. The challenge we've got, we've got a supply and demand challenge. We, we don't have the rain. That's the supply side. And the analogy I use is like income and money in the bank. So when it rains, that's our income. And, and the storage is the money in, in the bank. So because our income has significantly been reduced, we are drawing down on our, our bank, the storage. And it's not very sustainable, as we, you can imagine. So the challenge we've got right now is Aucklanders have already reduced their demand. Uh, we are not in a restriction, but they've heated to our calls. The lake levels are still falling. If we fall below 40% and we don't get the rain in May or June, we'll be staring down at restriction level two. And level two is where we start telling industries that we want them to cut back on production that we don't have water, because we are now preserving water for drinking, for the bare essentials, and, and that's the challenge. So we are very much at the mercy of uh, the weather. In the meantime, so we've asked for demand to be reduced. Aucklanders have heeded that. We haven't formally put restrictions, and restrictions can only be uh, put in after the council decides, because it's a council bylaw. Um, so water care cannot put restrictions. It's something that we would be coming to you to say we would like you to declare that we have level one restrictions or level two restrictions. In the meantime, what we are doing is we are drawing down heavily from the Waikato River. So we've got a capacity of 150 million liters a day, and we are drawing that um, at capacity. We are drawing down our Onehanga groundwater source, um, so we are optimizing all our existing sources so that we can have the supply side addressed while we don't have as much rain. So that's where we are, uh, Mayor Goff. Um, we, we are in a serious situation um, because we are very much at the mercy of the weather and we just haven't had the rain. And MET services have said that the rest of April isn't going to be very wet. They have said we might get rain in May. And I hope we do. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ravine. I know you have to get away um, in uh, about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I suspect there'll be some interest um, from uh, members of the emergency committee in asking questions. So can I suggest to members that um, uh, uh, one quick question and a, a, a brief comment. We'll, we'll just we'll do it in one, uh, and we've we've only really got about ten minutes with Ravine, so uh, I'll run through the uh, list as I normally do. Um, Deputy Mayor Bill Cashmore. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Ravine. Um, our Waikato resource consent to increase our take. Are we talking? Was Watercare talking to them? And do you need some assistance to try and advance our um, application up the list? So Waikato Regional Council, we are in discussions. They have said that if the river is flowing at high levels, at the moment it's not, but after May it may, they are happy for us to increase our take from 150 to 175. And, and what we are doing right now is we are upgrading our Waikato water treatment plant so that we can treat another 25 million litres a day. Because taking the water is one thing, we need to be able to treat it, and our treatment capacity is 150. So we've got works underway already at Waikato to increase the capacity to 175, and we believe that we can push 175 through the existing pipeline. Um, so Waikato Regional Council has come to the party and said we can take um, 25 million litres more once the river is flowing at a higher level, which they expect as soon as we get into May. Hey, thanks, Rene. That's at least a start. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, in, in relation to that, there is a, a further 
uh, application for resource consent that's been sitting there for several years now and that uh, I think we're now 99th in line, Ravine. We might have gone up even one or two. Um, yes, I you're right, Mayor Goff. So that, that is for um, the next stage and we would need to build the treatment plant and that's something that the board is seriously looking at, the timing of that, because it originally wasn't <laughs> until 2025. Yeah, I, I've, as you're aware, I've drawn that problem to the attention of the Minister for the Environment uh, because of uh, climate change means that we are going to, as we did last year, now this year and maybe in years to come, just find drought after drought after drought. We are going to need that extra capacity and that's one um, reasonably quick mechanism uh, for increasing the capacity. I know the Waikato Regional Council is, is sympathetic, uh, but they do have a backlog of resource consents and we need to deal with that problem. Um, Josephine Bartley. Um, I don't have any questions. Oh, actually, um, no, no, I don't. Don't, don't feel obliged, please. Um, uh, if you <laughs> don't have a question, that helps us get through in, in 10 minutes. So, Cathy Casey. Uh, Ravine, how, um, if we, uh, are you expecting us today to rationalise the state of restrictions? And two, once restrictions become mandatory, how do you police it if we're still under lockdown? Yes, very good question. So we've taken the view that we wouldn't want to be doing that during the lockdown, even under level three. Uh, so we are very reliant on Aucklanders responding to the message, Aucklanders being aware of the situation, uh, and that's why we, we've got a very strong um, social media and media presence around the issue, and I've just done an interview with Catherine Ryan. So we, we are getting the message out, and we are hoping that we don't need to police it. Um, if, if we get into stage two, then we will have to have the policing in place. So our position at the moment, unless the councillors feel otherwise, is that we shouldn't be doing a formal restriction, a level one restriction, we should continue our voluntary messaging. Um, I think as soon as you believe that it's necessary, Ravine, for us to uh, adopt that bylaw for level one, um, you'd find that uh, we will uh, willingly do so, but at this stage we're working on your advice that um, it's not required yet to formally adopt that bylaw. Um, uh, Councillor Collins. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Just wanted to say thanks, Ravine. I like the uh, analogy around savings, rain, and income. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pippacoom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Ravine, for the update. Um, no questions from me. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Linda Cooper. Thank you, Ravine. And I have been getting updates from, um, as the Councillor liaison from the Chair, Margaret Devlin. But I just, there's two questions. One is, have you the ability through, you know, monitoring remotely when, you know, as we, you know, you're always measuring people's use because it comes out on our bill. Is there an ability to target people if you had to, to be able to give them sort of gentle reminders? That's one question. Um, not, not home. Um, the, only, the only area where we have smart water meters is in Waiuku. So we have 3,000 smart meters in Waiuku where we know what they use every day. For the, for the rest of the domestic customers in Auckland, we only do a reading every two months. So we don't know. Uh, we do have lots of district meters around the city, so we know what areas use a lot of water. So we know, for example, that during the dry months of January, February, the Hobson area, what is Hobson for us, which is Ramira, was using a lot of water, and I said the gardens, and so we target the messaging there. With large industrial customers, yes, we do, and we are in, in discussions with them right now. And as you would realize, Cotton Soft, who make toilet paper, they're using four times more water than they ever did because they're making so much toilet paper. Um, it's interesting, given we're probably not using more. Um, so <laughs> just buying more. Um, the other question, Ravine, if you'll indulge me, Mr. Chair, is around the fact that um, normally, under normal circumstances, 
what I heard was you would put restrictions on, but you've held back because there's no ability to enforce at the moment. So it's not as if we don't need restrictions. It's just that you haven't put them because of the COVID-19. Is that, I just wanted to get that clear. Absolutely, but our, our messaging is as if we were in level one. So level one restrictions are you can't use the water outside your homes to wash cars, houses, water blasting. Uh, we would stop the use of hydrant stain pipes for purposes that trucks are using for keeping dust down and construction. And So um, all that is not happening. So the target audience has been mum and dads at home who were otherwise trying to wash their homes and do water blasting and all that. So the difference, the difference would be that we would send people who, uh, to homes where people are not obliging, and that's not what we are doing. But otherwise, the messaging is exactly the same. In fact, some people think we are already in level one restriction, and that's good. We, we would like them to think that. Thank you. thank you very much. Now, indulge Councillor Cooper because she is our liaison uh, councillor, and thank you for the work that you're doing there, Linda. But if we can restrict our, our, our questions to one from now on. Uh, councillor Angela Dalton. No questions, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Chris Darby. Morning, uh, thank you, Ravine. Um, just at, um, probably in, what was it, May, June last year, we had um, this challenge as well, not to this extent. So two years in a row, we got out of jail with some uh, extreme rain that fell in the late winter. Um, but here we face it again. So I'm looking at your climate strategy and it, it forecasts, it, talk, it discusses um, droughts in the spring and uh, greater rainfall events in the autumn. Uh, but we haven't got what that strategy uh, highlights. We just in this instance. So I guess going forward, Ravine, and I know you, you can uh, rely on your you know, demand ma management um, planning there, but going forward, what call are you going to make to the planning teams at Council to possibly request changes whereby people are required to retain water uh, wherever they can? Um, um, in developments, uh, and what call would you have on the planning team to start looking at microgrid systems and and that sort of thing? Because it, it it just seems like even when I look at your strategy, it it's not going to provide us with the tools um, from a planning perspective anyway to ensure that we do have a sustainable and reliable water supply. Yeah, it's a very good good question, and we will have conversations with, with council planners and our own. The challenge we've got is where we have assumed that storage in homes is going to reduce the demand on the water care system, uh, that has failed. That assumption failed. So early this year, because there was no rain, all the homes that are otherwise reliant on rain, they... Their, their demand was met by the water care system. So the demand on the water care system increased more than what we planned for. So what, what we now have to do is assume that all those storages are not working, which is counterintuitive. So I agree with you. Those storage tanks in people's homes will work as long as it's got rain, as long as there's income. <laughs> but if there's no income, uh, the bank will be empty. Uh, but we will, the point you are making is that we need to look at what are the strategies. And currently the Auckland water supply strategy has always been around, we will have a one year drought. Uh, well, we've got a drought that has continued over two years. So the storage we have in our lakes is equivalent to eight months demand, that's all. So if it doesn't rain at all, the amount of water we've got in storage is equivalent to eight months of demand in Auckland. So we have to seriously look at our, our strategy around supply and demand both. Thank you. Councillor Al Filipina. All good. Thank you. Councillor Chris Fletcher. I have no questions, but I just want to say I can think of no better hands on the tiller in these uncertain times than yourself, Ravine, so good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Shane Henderson. Uh, thanks for the update. No questions from me. Councillor Richard Hills. Uh, thank you. It's probably a 
comment question, but just I guess the two things that I'm getting when I put these messages out there is A, people want a bit more clear instruction, um, you know, at the moment where it's just guidelines, don't wash your car, don't wash your house, but I feel like they need a bit more uh, request and I don't, even when it's not legal, say smoking in parks, the knowledge that you definitely can't do something means your neighbours and whoever else kind of that social pressure. The uh, second thing is, what is the, uh, and I guess maybe an email could come in the next few days, is what is the long-term plan? Because this has sort of been two years, uh, really dry winters, then extremely dry summers, and we know with climate change it's going to continue, and I just worry, and everyone asks, you know, what a, you, if the Waikato is only 25 million litres a day, that's not going to cut it. I don't know where we go from here. So I guess if we could have an update in the next couple of weeks, because that's always is the next question people ask is, well, what are you doing to make sure um, this doesn't keep happening? But thank you so much for all the work. It's um, massive. Thank you. We'll do that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Member Tony Kake. Uh, just uh, Ravine, I've always um, referred to you as a man of integrity, mate. So keep up the good work. I've, um, I think all the, my questions have been answered. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tracy Mulholland. No questions. Thank you. Councillor Daniel Newman. Uh, look, Ravine, just a, a brief remark from me to thank you for the work that Watercare is doing at the moment to um, get all the water sources um, on stream as quickly as possible and keep up the great work. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Greg Sayers. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, just perhaps a quick comment, Ravine. Um, thank you for the messaging that you're getting out there. Uh, my comment would just be probably signalling, I appreciate that you can't really do different messaging across the region about, um, about where water sits, and, um, but just, to, just for you to be aware and perhaps your communications people that um, you know, in areas like Rodney they have uh, the aquifers, they have the new um, water treatment plant up there that's future proof, it's got very deep. Um, uh, you know, bore, and a lot of a lot of people are on bores themselves up there. So, um, just so you know, when when a message goes out, out like that from Water Care, it does create a lot of um, uh, messaging back to the local boards and myself about, oh, you know, why isn't Rodney resilient? This doesn't seem right um, when we've got the new plant and, and a lot of people on bores as well. So, I appreciate it would be confusing to send out different messaging. But I just want to make you aware of that if you weren't aware, uh, Ravine, that was all, and your, and your um, respective liaison teams. That no, thank you. No, you, you're right. The new water treatment we put in there is, has put that part of uh, Auckland in a better stead, but our message has to be for everyone. So, unfortunately, you're right, but uh, we'll take on board your messaging requirements. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Desley Simpson. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Ravine, if we've got problems in my ward, i.e. Auckland, uh, Rimiwera being one of the highest users, I'd appreciate some extra messaging I can uh, help uh, disseminate uh, to that community that might uh, help with the problem. And look, thank you very much for what you're doing. Um, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will do. Thank you. Councillor Sharon Stewart. Oh, thank you, Ravine. Keep up the good work. Um, I'd like to also thank David Hawkins for all the good work. But one, one of the things that I've um, noticed uh, this year is because of the dry weather, a lot of the pipes are, are moving, having a lot of leakage. Um, there's one that I've just just reported, which was reported on the 28th of March, a water leak, and then again reported on the 1st of April, a water leak um, from a private Apparently it's on the private property, but it looks like it's, it could be on the council firm, and people are quite concerned because there's been a lot of water that's been leaking for, for you know, since the 28th of March when it was first reported, and apparently been leaking for about a month or so before that. Um, can we can can we do something? Is there something that we can help you with, or, or you can do, like they do in Australia, if there's leakage on a private property? that we we can actually go in and or, or you can go in and fix it and then it's it's um the the owner of the property would have to sort it out a little bit later on if we have a problem finding and trying to locate the owner of the property because if we had many many months of um enough water that could 
full of swimming pool leaking and because it's on private property, it's not a very good look. So is there anything we can do there, Ravine? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, the council can, under its uh, numerous local government powers, water care can't. It's something that we are looking at. In Singapore and many other places, the water authority is able to go in and fix it and then put the charge back on the owner. Uh, in, in Auckland, in New Zealand, the council, because water supply is a council business and we are part of council, council does have the powers to do that. Thank you. Uh, Chair, David Taipuri. Uh, Moreno, Ravine, uh, no questions, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wayne Walker. Um, two quick questions, Ravine. Um, first off, just referring to Australian cities, why can't Auckland do what Australian cities have done for some years? That's around offering rebate, rebates for water tanks, enhancing grey water recycling. And the other question goes to your comparison with the dams being a bank. Is not a distributed reserve, that is, a multiplicity of water tanks across all of Auckland, identical in concept to the dams as far as a bank? And does not that make a substantial contribution to, to um, enhancing supply? because you're capturing all of that water across the catchment. Thank you. Ravine? Yeah, um, I think the, the study was done by Beckers for us and Council a few years ago. The, you, if you're referring to storage in homes, uh, st storage in homes will work if you have the larger volumes of storage. And I think Mayor Goff has got larger volumes of storage at his place at Ardmore. And so he was in a better space than most others. So I think he, the answer to your question is yes, you can, but you need far more storage than a, a piddly little tank on the side of the house because that just gets eaten up very quickly. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Ravine. I won't mention the fact that um, I'm right next to your water filter station and I can't get water from you, but I have got 80,000 <laughs> litres of storage. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, Councillor John Watson. A uh, quick question, Ravine. In terms of the contribution of Aucklanders to voluntary saving, am I right in assuming that at a time when people are, st uh, are staying at home that usually one would expect their water usage to, to go up, i.e. they're in the house all day, they may be out exercising more or whatever. So A, is that a right assumption? And B, if it is, then that would seem to be indicative that, that Auckland is even responding more than we would expect. Yeah, you, you're right. Our, our high-level analysis suggests that the first week was baking week in most homes, and I had three daughters, and when they were young, if they did the baking, the kitchen was a mess, and it took more to clean up. So I think a lot more water was used because people are in the house. Our understanding from uh, the supermarkets is last week was uh, grooming week, so they sold a lot of uh, hair dyes and things. So last week would have been a lot of long time in the shower and washing of hair. Now, you're right. Um, people staying home are using more water, but then there was a corresponding decrease in water use because most of the businesses were closed. Thank you. John, you asked last week about the supply to rural uh, through rural tankers. Um, Ravine, I think we've been supplying about up to a, a million litres a day um, through the, our use of Fonterra tankers. Um, but the demand for that is the water tank. We've, we've had enough rain to fill many of the water tanks. The demand for that has uh, fallen back, and I think that ceases uh, this, this coming Tuesday, doesn't it? Yes, that's right, yeah. Okay, that's good. That, that just answers your question from last week, John. Um, Councillor Paul Young. Uh, thank you, Ravine. No question, Mr. Mayor. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Ravine, and I just want to make the, the comment, I think, uh, on behalf of everybody. We are ready to go um, to bring in Level 1 mandatory restrictions as soon as that is requested. Uh, I have been notified by the Chair of your Board that... Uh, uh, you know that you may want to do that in the next couple of weeks and uh, we will respond immediately to that. We, we recognise the severity of this drought and the need to act 
And it, it, as one of the councillors, I think, just commented, um, if we have that mandatory restriction there, um, then the social pressure of somebody standing in the front of their garden, watering the garden or washing their car, uh, just is that much stronger. So um, that's the, our invitation to you. As soon as uh, you believe that that is required, um, we will act upon it. So thank you very much, and I hope we haven't held you up too late for your, for your next appointment. No, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Goff and councillors. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank right, we, we now come to the uh, substantive COVID-19 briefing, and we have uh, Ian Maxwell and Kate Crawford on the line. Uh, I don't know which of you would like to, to lead off on that, but uh, um, if you can do a, a quick presentation and we'll respond uh, hopefully succinctly and quickly to that. So look, I'll start, uh, Your Worship. So just um, what Kate will do is she will outline where we are with respects to the Auckland um, uh, Emergency Coordination Centre, and then I'll come in after that and talk about, in particular, about how Council uh, is gearing up to provide services under Alert Level 3. So, Kate, are you there? Yes, good morning. Sorry, yes, so if you could just talk through the... Uh, where you're at with the Emergency Coordination Centre and the Auckland Emergency Management Office. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, good morning, Mayor Phil and councillors, and thank you very much for having us here again with you to provide an update for Auckland Emergency Management's response to the current, the response to the current state of national emergency due to COVID-19. The nationwide state of uh, national emergency has been extended by a further seven days to next Wednesday, the 29th of April. And as you will be well aware, we remain at alert level four with a planned shift to alert level three after 11.59 p.m. on Monday, the 27th of April. I am joined this morning by Mace Ward and, and Tanya Winslade. And uh, we have made um, a slight change to the way we are managing the duties of the group controller. Um, and rather than talk, uh, taking a week on and off, Mace and I are now doing, um, working alongside each other um, to, in, in, to ensure continuity of leadership. Um, so Mace is kindly um, supporting me as a deputy control in the deputy controller role. This is a structural decision that allows us to spread some of the leadership responsibilities, um, which are heightened right now as we focus on both response and recovery. And Rachel will continue to be the duty controller on the weekends. Tanya joins me to support any questions that you may have about the liaison work stream. And when it comes to your questions, I may defer to Mace and Tanya um, to help me with those responses. So our update will cover five core areas of activity and I will commence with the Emergency Coordination Centre status. So our Emergency Coordination Centre at Bledisloe House remains active with a team of people from across Auckland Emergency Management and the Council working together with representatives from other responsible agencies. Sorry, I'll move closer. With other representation from across other response agencies in the region. Those that um, do not need to work in the office join us remotely from home. We're operating in tandem, but are located separately across the ECC with our re repatriation, isolation and quarantine coordination cell, which is a multi-agency response to managing the needs of returning um, travellers or New Zealand travellers. Caring for communities. Our response continues to be predominantly focused on the non-health related welfare needs of all Aucklanders and people isolating in our region. Our welfare um, food parcel initiative, which has now been running for three weeks, it does seem a little longer than that, um, but it has been for three weeks, has taken over 25,000 phone calls via the Auckland Council Contact Centre, which has resulted in more than 13,500 requests for assistance. As of Tuesday, we have dispatched 7,867 parcels and a further 5,000 are expected to go out in the next week or so. A few general ob observations around this piece are, Many Aucklanders are having to um, are facing sudden change in their circumstances and struggling to meet um, ends meet. Our teams are connecting calls to other services where possible, including other agencies for ongoing food assistance and providing guidance on how they may, might seek financial support through MSD. Many callers are reaching out for welfare assistance for the first time, and we do not underestimate just how hard it is for, for them when they ask for help. 
with regard to the basic food parcels that are being put together, the national supply chain is under considerable pressure. Other agencies like ourselves, food banks and charitable organisations are trying to source bulk supplies from the same supply chain, which also um, at which also supermarkets are, are, are um, attempting to Sorry, Kate, we're having a problem with your sound. Maybe if you take you, you take the video off, and that might help, but you're breaking up a bit there. If you could just start your, your last sentence again, please. Apologies. Sorry. Um, so from time to time availability, supplies will slow down and our distribution of food parcels, uh, for our distribution of food parcels, and we will continue to do our best to manage both expectations. I will advise at this point that the group controllers across New Zealand and the National Lifelines Coordinator are working with the National Crisis Management Centre on this issue. We have had grateful and positive feedback from many Aucklanders already and have dealt with a small number of issues and complaints. The latter, the latter might be anything from an issue with delivery to a delay or error in dispatching a parcel. Again, our teams continue to do their best to manage these and acknowledge the fact that people are under tremendous pressure right now, creating stressful, stressful situations at home. So the repatriation, isolation and quarantine coordination. As I mentioned earlier, this work stream is operating in a comp complementary way to the ECC Emergency Coordination Centre. It includes representatives from a number of partner agencies, including the Ministry of Health, New Zealand Defence Force and Police, airport agencies and government departments, and is focused on implementing the government's mandatory 14-day isolation conditions. Funded nationally, this program is delivered on a day-to-day -day basis by the multi-agency group based with us here. There are currently 2,300 people in managed isolation and 100 in quarantine in hotels in our region. This number changes daily as people reach their 14 day anniversaries as they are known and can return home and as new flights arrive home. Recent de developments include the standing up of a further, further welfare service to help the welfare and psychological support um, and psychosocial support for returnees to, in managed isolation and quarantine, including on-site social work support. We are also providing local assistance from the repatriation of foreign nationals. This is essentially coordinated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, foreign governments and airlines. We are simply making sure that people can transit easily through Auckland when it comes time to return home. Tipo Whakarai. As you heard before, we have stood up our Maori specific function under the ECC structure to work with Maori communities. Tipa Whakarai has supported the establishment of Tiparangi Information Portal and provides accessibility for whānau hoa, in, which is sight and hearing impaired. It continues with its outreach programs to Marae, Iwi and Matawaka, organisations including 13 staff from the Council's Maori Staff Network making outreach calls to 700 vulnerable Maori on behalf of MSD, 66 isolated and vulnerable Kamatua who have have been referred through the Maori Staff Network to Tipa Whakurai for support. <coughs> Excuse me. Continuing to contact Iwi and Matawaka and Marae to check in and to identify welfare needs, delivering cleaning packs and food parcels and food support to Marae and Farnau and Urupa signage, general coordination and tasking. We continue to work with police and uh, maritime services and response agencies to deter boaties from heading to Aotea Great Barrier Island during lockdown. As we are, um, as we are approaching um, alert level three and moving from alert level four, this creates unnecessary pressure on the residents of Great Barrier Island and the island's resources. Our lifelines coordination function continues to work on our response to Auckland's drought conditions including the ongoing initiatives with the Council's Healthy Waters Department on Rural Water Supplies and a watching brief on Water Care's water supply status. And as always, we maintain the ability to stand up a further emergency response if needed. I would like to end by acknowledging all of the Auckland Emergency Management and Council staff that have been working on this response. This is a seven day operation and is blended uh, is a blend of tactical and problem solving alongside strategic planning. 
While guided by a pandemic planning, our agency are also required to build processes and respond to new situations as we go. And the collaborative work we are doing with other government agencies, response organisations, partners and our community is key to making this work. And we are very grateful for the depth of the interagency support that is currently underway right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, if we come back to you, and if you've okay. got uh, some matters to add to that. Yes, look, uh, thank you, Your Worship. So I'm going to focus more on our organisation, our group, if you like, Auckland Council. So we've had no further cases of COVID across the council group. Uh, we've had three cases altogether, uh, and all of those individuals are recovering well. But look, with the announcement by the Prime Minister uh, earlier this week, I'm going to focus today very much on what services Council uh, will operate, will run uh, from next Tuesday when we move to Alert Level 3. And also I'll just run through briefly how our people will be working um, during that Alert Level 3. So under Level 3, our focus is very much upon safety. And in general, our people and our staff uh, must work from home unless that is not possible. And their bubbles need to stay small and effectively uh, they need to stay at home as much as possible. So our workplaces will remain closed to all but a few of our staff. And people who are vulnerable to the virus, those who are older, those who have existing medical conditions will, will certainly remain at home. And actually this will continue right through to the end of Alert Level 2. But look, under, under Level 3, we must limit the interaction of our staff with customers and we must not encourage Aucklanders to gather together. And as a result of that, normal services such as our libraries, our pools, our gyms, our community and arts centres, our campgrounds, our holiday parks, community venues for hire, our animal shelters, our playgrounds, all remain closed under level, uh, Alert Level 3. Public toilets and toilets and parks, except for those required to support essential workers such as truck and bus drivers, will also uh, remain closed. So all of that is very similar to Alert Level 4. But there are some differences as a result of Alert Level 3. And in summary, I'll, I'll run through those briefly. So our inspection services, uh, our staff such as noise control officers, environmental health officers, building inspectors will recommence their roles. Uh, their roles will be managed in a way that they meet health requirements, and I'll talk a bit about uh, that later, but essentially those services will commence. Our regional parks and gardens will open, although again uh, vehicle access to those will be closed, uh, but the actual parks themselves and the botanic gardens and so forth will be open. Uh, the park rangers will be working on site. Our waste, we're working to open our waste transfer stations, but we're still um, putting a bit of effort into how we may do that. We want to avoid a situation where there are queues of cars uh, or vehicles. and who can work safely in our offices. The other change uh, concerns asset maintenance and construction or capital projects. So our asset maintenance programs and our capital projects can recommence, but there's a couple of um, situations we, we need to be careful here. One is that every project and every program which does recommence must uh, follow safety controls. And so many of the construction firms involved with our Capital Works projects are developing those as we speak. Um, so there'll be some quite significant controls around accessing construction or getting near the, the movement of the workers within the sites. But the other issue, which I'm sure you are each aware of, is that council is not in the same financial position as we were prior to COVID-19, and our revenue is down some hundreds of millions of dollars. So given the need to manage prudently, we need to, we need to manage our financial commitments. And while 
clearly the construction projects that are underway, where there are workers that's under contract, they'll recommence. We need to look at the pipeline of projects coming through. And so that's a, a piece of work that's, that, that's going on at the moment. We just simply can't turn the, the whole tap back on, uh, given the sort of financial reality we find ourselves in. In summary then, Alert Level 3 is a change from Alert Level 4, but Alert Level 3 is still very restrictive for the nature of council services and practice. So it's not a significant change from what we've been having over the last month or so. An example of that is the approach to governance. This very committee, the emergency committee, is held digitally, it's held remotely, and, uh, and that will continue under Alert Level 3. The essential services that have been operating will obviously continue to operate, but it does, the new alert level does provide for some additional services as well as construction and maintenance to recommence. So we're likely to have a few additional staff working from their normal places of work. As part of alert level three, the government requires all places of work to be safe, and, and clearly so do we. Um, so we need to be able to ensure who is at work, the location of their work, and also who they're actually interacting with. So every person who comes to work will need to maintain a brief record or a diary of where they went and who they interacted with. And those records will aid the tracing of people should anyone become sick. We also need to ensure that our work, that at work our staff can maintain physical distancing. So this effectively means spreading out, uh, taking up more floor space than usual. And for those people, particularly field staff, inspectors, environmental health officers, etc., who are interacting with Aucklanders, they may need appropriate training and personal protection equipment uh, beyond that. As you'll be aware, the supply of personal protection equipment is an issue right across New Zealand, and our priority for the nation is being given to health professionals. So we are holding some uh, personal protection equipment within council, and what we will be doing is we will be prioritising that which is available, and we'll be clearly targeting uh, people who are interacting with Aucklanders. We're also looking forward to what Alert Level 2 will look like for Council. We don't know when Alert Level 2 uh, will commence, uh, but it will commence um, following Alert Level 3, and we're putting quite a bit of effort into, um, into what that looks like. Many of our services will uh, reopen, although, again, uh, there might be a staged approach to reopening services given the health requirements and, indeed, the sort of emergency budget situation uh, that, that we find ourselves in. So our staff are putting work into what Alert Level 2 looks like, and, and more information around that will become available over the next sort of 10 days or so. So look, I'll stop there, and I'm sure between Kate and myself we can respond to any questions, and if there's anything in particular you want us to chase up, if you um, write it down, we'll do that um, uh, outside of the particular meeting. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ian and Kate, and can I just acknowledge that we also have online, I think, Tanya Winslade and Mace Ward. Um, so <clears throat> I'll work uh, backwards uh, on questions, uh, integrate questions and comments. Um, if, if they're necessary, please don't feel obliged to, to make a comment because uh, we are trying to uh, get through a pretty long agenda today without the extraordinary hours of last week. Um, can I just, on the matter of agenda, indicate to uh, members and councillors um, that we will move at the end of our, uh, I think, item 12 into confidential uh, to discuss the uh, Audit and Risk Committee uh, Risk and Assurance Update. And following that, <clears throat> we'll also have a, a financial update um, from uh, Kevin Ramsey. So I'm not sure whether that's in members' diaries, but if you can make sure um, that you can hang on for that, if we can get to that quite quickly without a, an extension uh, of, of the day, uh, that would be good. It just gives us an update on where we're at uh, along the process of uh, um, going back to consultation and, uh, and, and having a budget, we hope, uh, uh, finalised by, by mid to, to late July. Okay, um, I'll start at the bottom, so uh, questions and comments, uh, just one each, please, um, and we'll start with Councillor Paul Young. Paul? Uh, thank you, Ian and Ted. Uh, no question, no comment from me. <coughs> thank you. Yeah, Councillor John Watson. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, Ian, just in respect of your comment about um, the projects starting up again, um, 
I, I'm assuming that projects are, that are you know um, half finished or, or underway, they will automatically be resuming. There will be no question of them being affected by the shortage of council income. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The, um, they're under contract, and uh, and obviously, you know, you'd be spending money and not getting any um, outcome if you pulled away from those. It's more the projects that haven't reached the, that stage, so in the pipeline coming down through the system. Okay. Secondly, um, in, in terms of uh, the need and our support, uh, you know, food packages and stuff. At our last meeting, we we were. Um, we're told there might be some possibility of, of getting a heat map to show where the demand is coming from. So, for instance, <coughs> Councillor Walker and I are, are, um, are hearing that you know there's greater demand in parts of our community than was the case even you know just a week ago. So, is that coming through, or, or are there problems with that? Um, yes. Good morning, and thank you for this uh, question. Um, we're actually just finalising the heat map um, in the next 24 hours, and it'll be released very soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks, John, and I, I think Auckland Transport has advised me that they will be reopening most of their projects uh, as of uh, Tuesday morning, uh, which means uh, 2,500 construction workers just uh, for Auckland Transport alone will be back at work. Uh, but following the guidelines, the health and safety guidelines that Ian outlined. Uh, Councillor Wayne Walker. Sure, um, two comments. Um, first off, is it possible to have some written notes um, around these updates um, on each occasion because there's a lot of information there. Yes, it is. I'll, I'll get that done to you. I must admit, I've, I write them out for myself, so it won't be too difficult to get them out. Yeah, And, they're, they're, and they're that also right. goes to some of the previous updates because it's, I mean, this isn't a really important time for us to um, capture in terms of ongoing resilience. The the other question I've got um, just goes to yes, prioritisation. Just goes to prioritisation, and people in the community have certainly brought to my attention the poor state of footpaths. There have been injuries brought to my attention, so I just um, emphasise that those things are important in terms of work that we do. Um, thank, thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, look, we, if, if councillors would prefer to have something in writing, uh, there, are, there are updates done regularly, so um, we can make those available to councillors. Uh, um, in terms of inquiries, I, I did ask about um, because uh, some of the MP I, I talk uh, this, I'm talking this week, both to the National and Labour Party caucuses in Auckland. Um, there, has been, there was a huge demand going from councillors to AEM. I forget how many queries a day. It was 50, 50 a day, and that was slowing down their work. Um, so we're, um, if, if you've got queries that are really important, feed them through as you have been through your uh, EAs, uh, but we're trying to keep a bit of pressure off the, uh, uh, the Auckland Emergency Management. Um, thank you, councillor. And uh, uh, Chair David Typeri. Oh, kia ora, Your Worship. Um, this is probably more of a question to you. Uh, when is it likely that the emergency committee um, format will uh, cease to ex operate? Uh, and when can uh, the Independent Māori Statutory Board meet with the Council under its obligations under legislation? Yeah, um, I've got Phil Wilson in the room with me, so I'll get him to comment on that. What uh, endeavouring to do, obviously, under Level 3, uh, as with Level 4. Uh, there will still be some restrictions, but hopefully as we get into Level 2, we can, we can start to resume uh, something closer to normality. But, Phil, you might like to comment on that. Um, Chair David and councillors, um, we're working on that, on that scenario right now. It's likely, I have to say, that we will recommend um, status quo with the emergency committee, um, rationalised decision making and so forth um, right through level three. But beyond that, um, we're doing the planning now and I should be in a position to report that um, very shortly. And, and that, would, um, that would apply by extension to meetings of the governing body with the IMSB board. Uh, thank you. I raise that, Your Worship, because uh, I want to address a number of the matters that continually be reported to us, uh, and I've had some written responses that are, are too general in my mind, and I think it's important uh, that as soon as possible 
<coughs> excuse me, the board can meet with the uh, uh, governing body uh, to address a, a number of issues. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, David. I'll take one on, on board. And I, I think both Phil and I indicated that uh, we're still going to have to do this uh, stuff remotely, uh, certainly through level three. But getting into level two, I think we can start to re-examine and, and hopefully get uh, some of the other committees up and functioning normally. Because while we're doing the urgent stuff now, uh, there will be a backlog. So we'll have quite long agendas, I think, into the future. Uh, Councillor Sharon Stewart. No comment. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sharon. Um, Councillor Desley Simpson. No, thank you very much for the update. No comment or question. Uh, Councillor Greg Sayers. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you good. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, I could hear you good. As soon as I said that, you, you faded out. Um, so can you have a, have a try again? I think we've lost you for the moment, Greg. Um, I, I may come back and see if um, we've got some improvement in your, your line there. Um, so I'll just hold you over for a moment. Uh, Councillor Daniel Newman. Uh, no questions. Thank you very much. For the Thank break. you. Councillor Tracy Mulholland. Thanks, Your Worship. No questions or comments or just a little thank you to Perul and the team at Waste 2 who fixed oh. a major Salvation Army problem. So thank you. Oh, I'm glad to, glad to hear that's fixed. Um, Councillor Richard Hills. No question, just congratulations to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, count, uh, member Tony Kake. Uh, kia ora. Uh, and just a quick um, thank you to the emergency team and working in partnership with a lot of other essential services, particularly I want to acknowledge, uh, well, I see them as part of the whole council family, the Auckland Transport staff that helped us deliver over 4,000 hygiene packs to 98 streets in Papakura over the last two weeks. So, uh, Mayor Phil, if you could pass on my support to the, uh, the to the leadership team within Auckland Transport for making their staff available to do that. Also, the um, I, I'm a little bit like David. I'd like to see a Māori specific plan as it relates to the impact of going back to level three, level two, as it relates to Māori contractors, Māori staff in vulnerable Māori communities. And I think we have to be quite specific because they, the generalist approach has never really worked for Māori. So, but I think it, it just um, confirms, uh, I guess, what um, the, the, in more detail what David Taipati wants to, to take on with you guys and, and how, we, how we might engage the independent Māori statutory board staff in developing that, uh, that response. Kia ora. Thank you, Tony, and, and thank you for the work at the uh, Papakura Marae. Um, you know, I've been down there on a number of occasions, and including you know over the Christmas period when you do your food packages, and uh, you, you make a huge contribution to the community there. So thank you to you and your team for the work there. Um, can I come back to Greg Sayers? Greg, um, can we have another go at, at your question? <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Me. Sorry I dropped out there. Um, Ian, I just had a question around, um, you mentioned about the transfer stations and you're doing some work around how they might be opened in a way that didn't create um, you know, queues of people, because I'm sure there's plenty of people that have trailer loads of uh, goodies they want to get rid of after doing so much work around their properties, <laughs> um, probably myself included. Um, so we, we, are you looking at something like the a booking system like we have for the inorganic collections where people could you know, book to um, visit these transfer stations? Or are you able to enlighten a little bit about how that might be managed with ideas that you have going forward? Look, I'm afraid I, I can't. Um, what I can do, though, is I can catch up after this meeting uh, with Parul from uh, Waste Solutions, and we can get, because I know she's certainly putting some thought into how to manage this, this issue, and um, I can get that information out to you. Yeah, okay. Th thank you, Ian. Much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. That's a really good question. So um, maybe, Ian, if you can get back to all of us on that, and also when we might uh, expect the inorganic uh, collections to resume, which I presume will be again uh, not until uh, level level two or maybe even level one. Um, but that would be useful, I think, to all of us. Um, Councillor Shane Henderson. Uh, nothing, thanks. Well done. Great work. Thank you, Councillor Chris Fletcher. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Alf Filipina. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and, and, and again to everybody, well done on the work um, that, that's happened to date. Uh, Ian, at what stage will information uh, go out to our community around uh, what happens during uh, Level 3? 
uh, for example, um, at our cemeteries. I know that Nikki is, is waiting um, for MOH um, to, to, to send some guidelines, and then that can be shared to the community. Uh, what you said earlier, Ian, around our parks, um, libraries uh, and not being open. Uh, to save all that confusion, when is something going to be released, whether it be through Auckland or through um, uh, yourself, um, your worship, um, that goes out to our community so they know and they're not guessing? Look, look thank you. Um, we expect that to go out tomorrow. Uh, there, will, there will still be some uncertainty. So, for example, you highlighted the issue with the cemetery. So there's there's information not just from, if you like, council, but also from, in that case, Ministry for Health. But look, in general, information about our services will go out tomorrow. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, Councillor Chris Darby. Nothing from me, Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dalton. Thank you. Um, a quick question. Do you have an idea of when the food parcels will stop? Because I understand exactly what you're saying about the they're under pressure and the supply chain's under pressure, but we're going to have quite a gap to fill once it stops from a community level. So are we looking at continuing through level three and then ceasing? I'll get Kate to answer that because I had the same conversation with her yesterday, Angela. Kate. Yes, and thank you very much for this question. So um, this is a government-directed initi initiative, so at this stage we don't have an end date as such, but we are working with the National Crisis Management Centre to ensure that when we do have an identified transition date um, or period that we are communicating that appropriately and that we, as we transition, we work very closely with the other food bank providers and um, social services that are delivering other services to the communities as well. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's an important question, and uh, I'm imagining that the government funding will continue through Level 3, uh, and then, rather than a sudden and abrupt halt, because we're doing delivering over 800 packages a day some days, we'll need to transition out back to the normal food banks uh, who, who would generally do this. Uh, it was always seen as a bridge, uh, particularly with the large number of people that uh, were suddenly finding themselves without a job. Uh, but, you know, my, my, my stress to uh, Minister Cepoloni will be to keep it going for as long as that real level of pressure exists and not to transition until uh, the food banks uh, are able to cope um, in a more normal situation. Uh, Councillor Linda Cooper. Um, kia ora, Mr Mayor, and thanks to the um, civil defence team. Um, my question, and you mentioned around revenues, etc., and you talked about some sorts of enforcement. Um, is this going? Do you, is this going to actually help with our revenue again, given that we rely more heavily on outside revenue than we do on rates? You think is there a time frame where, I mean, not so much consent, building consents, but um, that other regulatory kind of income we get? I think. Um, thank you, Councillor. I think the. Um this is going to sound terrible, but I think the, the, the level of revenue um, associated with those activities is comparatively marginal to the, to the overall revenue loss that, that, that the council and the council group has, has, has suffered as a result of the COVID crisis. So, yes, I'm sure there will be some marginal increase, but it's, it's primarily aimed at supporting the construction activity, the, the reopening of takeaways, those sorts of things. So I don't think it's a, it's a significant um, revenue source in the sense of the wider council situation. So we're going to be doing it tough for a lot longer. Thank you. Um, now, Councillor Alf Filipina had a supplementary on food parcels. Um, uh, Councillor Filipina? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. And question to Kate. Kate, um, uh, as a result of some of the uh, food banks that we have in, in Tamaki, um, do we, is there an option for those people who have the ability to deliver, accessing the parcels that are being um, put together at uh, Spark and Vector through, um, obviously, Level 3. 
Um, thank you very much. That, that is a really great question, but I might actually pass this to Mace to answer as he's been doing some operational work in this area. Well, those sound effects were something. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, councillors. Thanks. Thanks. Councillor Philip. I don't know if you're in the same room as uh, as Kate, but um, there's another. You're getting a lot of feedback, so if you can close down uh, any other microphone near you, thank you. Yep, go ahead, Mace. Sorry about sorry about that, uh, councillors. Uh, we have changed rooms now. So, uh, yes, Councillor Philip Piner, uh, we are. Um, I've, I've lost my train of thought actually about, about, about that, but largely we are transitioning to um, back to food banks over the next two weeks, as Kate, as Kate mentioned, um, and we are providing support into food banks um, additionally as well. So from time to time, as food banks find the same problems as we're finding with supply chain uh, for food, we are providing top-ups uh, for food banks as and Marae, in fact, as well. I'm happy to talk um, separately with you if you want to talk offline. Thank, uh, yes, thank, please, thanks very much. Um, thanks, uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Pippa Coon. Thank you for the update. Uh, I would, would like to know if there's going to be any further communication about how level three is applied differently to our remote community. So I guess the question is, is there going to be a, any different application of level three to our remote communities? And I'm thinking particularly on the islands and the travel where Auckland Transport's put out information to say that travel's okay within your region or extending your bubble, but that actually probably isn't correct when it comes to um, Aotea and Waiheke. So we'd just like to know if there is any further work being done about um, Level 3 for our remote communities and if there is going to be comms that really addresses how alert Level 3 is going to be applied generally and specifically. Look, thank you. Um, so at the moment what we know is that the short answer to the question is no. Um, it's being applied generally across the country and regions. However, that said, we also are aware that um, the chair of the Waiheke Local Board has contacted um, various ministries in Wellington around this very issue. So it is a, it is a live issue at the moment. Uh, I think for Great Barrier Island, uh, apart from boaties going out there and the view from the New Zealand police is that there's actually far fewer boaties out there now. They've been coming home and they feel there's not an issue. Uh, but for Waiheke, the ferries continue to operate and there's a bit of concern, particularly from the island community. But I think as we speak right now, um, there's no specific uh, rules additional for remote communities. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Can, so will there be... Um, like Auckland Transport's done the what it means under Alert Level 3, can we, well, can we expect an update generally in terms of what it means wider with our facilities and services? Yes, I can do that. Um, so I'll put something together and I'll get that, that material out to you in the next sort of probably early, early tomorrow morning. So I, I wasn't, Mm, I wasn't no. thinking you, um, Ian, I was thinking more from the comms perspective. Is that going to be... Oh, well, when I say soon? me, it'll probably be some poor comms person that'll be doing oh, it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrible. But no, I'll make the promise and um, we'll get it delivered. So look, and I I'm also aware that there is this discussion going on in Wellington around mm. um, uh, it, 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 the, the sort of issue raised by the chair of the, of the Waiheke Local Board. And I know it's been raised by Stuart Island and a couple of others as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fesso Collins. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I just wanted to firstly say thanks to Mace for getting back to me in relation to media uh, queries that I received about uh, delay in, the delay in uh, food parcels. I just wanted to see Mace or Kate if you could um, maybe elaborate on some key uh, to give confidence some key things that are happening so that there isn't the delay that people are experiencing. I welcome uh, the news that you've been 
doing quite a bit of work and I understand that uh, you've been inundated. But I just think to give, um, before I make any comment to media, just to give some clarity on uh, the steps that are being taken to ensure that people aren't having to wait the kind of days that they're experiencing. Uh, Kate, you might be best placed to answer that. Yes, and thank you very much um, for the opportunity to ask this question. So um, we have been working over the over the past week um, to look at our data, our information that we hold on those that have called us to date. And we have done extensive work to ensure that we have confirmed those who have received their parcels and those who have not received their parcels to date. If there has been a uh, um, a period of a wait, longer than three days, we're doing our best to ensure that we're communicating with those people and keeping them informed on when the next deliveries will be taking place and when they should expect their package. Um, if they call into our call centre for um, a second time, we're ensuring that we do call them back and um, have the conversation with them about the expectations about delay. Um, from a national perspective, I'm working very closely with the nice National Crisis Management Centre and the National Lifelines Coordinator um, to ensure that the national um, uh, considerations are in alignment with our needs here in Auckland and to ensure that the issues that we are facing have a voice back down in the national setting. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Um, <clears throat> I know talking, uh, Councillor, to uh, Chris Farrelly at Auckland City Mission, their delays are currently, I think, about uh, 48 hours. Um, day before yesterday, we received over a thousand calls for the for the packages, so there is a bit of a delay. Uh, occasionally, there is a glitch where a name drops out of the system, and uh, if 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 we get that, then we can deliver an, a, a package urgently. Um, but I think people we'll probably have to show just a wee bit of patience, um, you know, with that uh, um, two to three days uh, wait while we have this pressure on, on our staff and they have to obviously uh, operate at a slightly lower level of productivity to maintain the, the two metres distancing, et cetera. Uh, but I have talked to Kate about this and we are trying to get them delivered as quickly as possible. Right, um, thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Cathy Casey. Oh, hi, Mace. Uh, can you just um, clarify something for me? Under Level 3, you're still obliged to take your exercise locally. Is, is that right? Mace? Perhaps I, I can perhaps answer that. It's Ian Maxwell here. Um, oh, hi, yeah. So the under Level 3... The, the, the story essentially is um, we very much as a nation want you to take um, your exercise locally, but you do have the capability of moving um, in the region. But in general, uh, we're encouraging and uh, people to take uh, exercise locally. That's one of the reasons why even in our regional parks, uh, we're going to uh, not permit um, vehicles to get into the regional park because we simply don't want people to be traveling right across the city. So, so the message still essentially under level three is stay local, although it's a lifted a small amount from what it was under level four. Uh, Great, I thank you, that clarifies that. Um, will you be making any changes at all to the current dog recommendations? I'm not sure if um, Claudia is on the line. She may be able to respond to that. Uh, Koto, this is Claudia. I, I actually don't know if there's going to be any changes from what we've done in Level 4, but I will also follow up with Craig. I believe there is going to be um, some additional services that Craig's regulatory team will be providing around potential dog management or particularly dog concerns, but I, I can follow up. Hi, Claudia. In particular, if you're allowed to move outside of your local area, that's what dog owners have been wanting to take the dogs to beaches and far-flung parks. That's the essential question. Is that now allowed after Tuesday? And my second question is just an, an update, please, on the on, ongoing care for homeless people across the region. I think, Kate, you've probably got that. Uh, yes, thank you very much for that question. Sorry, I was just ensuring that we did, weren't going to have feedback as I responded. Um, so, yes, there is a series of work that is happening in, in regards to the series.
area um, and we're working through our welfare hub with our welfare partners across Auckland to ensure that the needs are being met as well as ensuring that this is included in our recovery planning under caring for community. So at this moment um, there is some further directives and information coming out in national areas and we're working our way through that information so I can provide you um, further clarity offline. <coughs> Um, Thanks, Kate. Appreciate that. On the question of homeless, uh, Cathy, uh, we have um, we're getting uh, material through from Housing First and the housing agencies. I think we're housing um, up to around 500 people that would normally have been homeless or rough sleepers. And I've raised with um, Minister Cepaloni that um, there's obviously it's going to be quite important when we come to the end of level three. <clears throat> not to take people out of motels and say, well, you're back out in the street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> there's a big challenge there, um, not an easy one to solve, but how we transition back and try to maintain um, that housing support for people that were previously sleeping rough. Um, can I just make one other comment? And well, it's really a question um, to Ian and Kate. I can see some problem with the change of definition from local to regional. Local is now quite clearly defined under level four. It's in your, your neighbourhood. Uh, I'm not sure what regional means in relation to Auckland. Uh, does it mean that I can go to see um, um, my my son in Pukekohe, because that's part of my, I'm in the Franklin Ward. I presume that's regional. Um, but would I be allowed to go across to the other side of the shore um, uh, if, I, if I had a relation, a, a close family member there? Uh, if there's a grey area, there'll be trouble. Uh, and I think we need to seek out uh, if we can get a, a, a more specific definition of what regional means, uh, because if it's if it's left up to our discretion, um, then we'll we'll extend the boundaries. So um, maybe if if you could uh, work on that, Ian, that would be that would be helpful. Yes, certainly. And it's I think if if you've just been reading Councillor Hill's comments, that the regional is is very um, orientated towards work. Uh, so I think the message of staying local is still very much uh, the right message under level three. So that's a conservative interpretation, um, but I'm not sure everybody will take that unless it's, um, uh, it's, it's made slightly clearer. Uh, Councillor Josephine Bartley. Um, thank you. Thank you everyone for your work. Um, I'm still getting photos sent to me of people playing on playgrounds, and I'm wondering if there's a link with uh, people playing on playgrounds, with the areas that um, have got development where there are no more backyards, and that's why they're going into the playgrounds. Is there any way we can do more to close off the playgrounds aside from just signs and, and target those playgrounds that we, we, we tape up, for instance, because I know we've got over 8,000? Kia ora, Councillor. Um, this is Claudia. I might be able to comment on that. It's um, What I can do is if you can possibly send to me the information that where you've got specific concerns, either to me directly or to Rod Sheridan, then we can follow up on those playgrounds that might be at risk and look at what additional measures we need to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claudia. Um, Deputy Mayor Bill Cashmore. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the daily updates. No questions. OK, thank you very much um, for all of the team that's online today. And can you pass our collective thanks on um, to the, uh, the 257 Auckland Council staff members who are contributing to the work of the Auckland uh, Emergency Committee? Um, I think that's a big effort. Uh, big thanks to our librarians for bringing nearly 15,000 over 70-year-olds, not with uh, uh, um, internet connections. And I know that there is another team, uh, Kate, that's shortly um, be focused on contacting uh, Pacifica members of the community uh, to, to check on their well-being. Um, so there's a big effort going on there, and, uh, and, and I want to acknowledge everybody that's involved with it. So that, uh, if I just, uh, I'll move and maybe, uh, uh, Sharon, you would like to second that we receive the report and uh, uh, the, the reports both, basically, they're both from uh, Ian and Kate and their team and also from uh, Ravine Jadaram and thank them for that, uh, for their work. Thank you.
Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, aye. No. Carried. Right, we now come to um, item number nine on the agenda, uh, community loan guarantees. And I just want to check that Lee uh, Redshaw, uh, our investment specialist, is uh, on the line uh, for this item. Good morning, Mayor Gough. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Lee. Um, can I ask Councillor Simpson to move this and maybe uh, Councillor Henderson uh, to second it? This would normally have gone to uh, F&P committee, and then uh, we'll have Lee uh, give an introduction. Um, Councillor Simpson, Councillor Henderson, you're happy to move and second? Absolutely, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Lee, uh, if you'd like to outline the paper to us, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr Goldfan, good morning, Councillor. Um, I didn't expect to be back in front of you uh, so soon with regards to loans and guarantees, but nevertheless, um, events have changed. Um, just to recap, the Council has approximately 15 loans and guarantees, and the guarantees uh, amount to $3.6 million, are required of those, and $1.3 million worth of loans to 10 organisations. All of the guarantees are worked with the ASB Bank. Um, and due to, the, due to the current situation, the organisations are in discussions with their bank uh, to look at options regards uh, interest referral, um, loan repayment um, uh, capitalisation of the interest, and deferring the actual um, terms of the loans. Um, all of those uh, discussions with the bank require uh, further discussion with the council and approval of the council. Oh, sorry. Can, can't hear him properly. Is that correct in anything? That's Hello? better. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so all of the organisations, um, whilst the The matter may be of small monetary value in the overall scheme for the council. Each of the organisations that I've spoken to, the executives are typically volunteers and are all stressing to make sure they can save their organisations and they want to take up the options that are. Um, excuse me, Lee, sorry to interrupt, but um, I'm getting messages that, um, and, and I'm finding it myself, um, that you're fading at times. Can you talk directly towards the microphone so we can hear clearly? Uh -huh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Goffey. I do have a headset on. It's that's that's it's much a, better now. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do I need to recap anything? Uh, no, I think just keep going, and we'll we'll ask questions if if okay, there's thank you. missed out on. So, all of the organisations that have guarantees, the people that have contacted me, uh, identifying that they are stressing, they want to save their organisations, they want to take up the option. Audio problems. Yeah, sorry, Lee, you're fading again. I'm not quite sure. Sometimes you're coming through very loud and clear, and then you look like you've walked about um, uh, three metres backwards from the microphone. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but if you can try to rectify it, that would be helpful. Uh, so, uh, apologies. Look, I'm sitting, I'm sitting still at my desk, and I have a headset on, so I'm not going very far. Maybe a, a loose wire, I'm not too sure. Um, can you hear me now, Mr. Goff? Um, yep, yep. We'll, we'll try, keep trying, and if, it, if, it, if the problem persists, we'll get you to phone in. But okay, um, thank you. keep trying for the moment. Okay. Um, so the guarantees, they need um, council approval of the changes that they're looking for, and the same with the loans from the council. The organisations are seeking assistance to reorganise the loans. It would normally go to the finance committee for approval. Um, and so what we're looking for is largely a procedural matter. Uh, delegating the approval to change the, the terms and conditions to the, the GCFO and the Group Treasurer and to document them accordingly, and then we will report back to the committee at the end of the lockdown period um, or even at the end of COVID, um, yeah, lockdown one, um, and uh, explain the delegations that we've ex exercised. Any questions? Um, thank you, Lee. Yeah, yeah, you're still coming and going. I, I'm, I'm getting most of it, and I hope that um, other members of the committee are. Um, so we'll just open it up. Um, maybe if I start with the, the Chair of Finance and Performance Committee, uh, Desley Simpson, and then Shane Henderson, if you have any questions at this point. Look, I might just help. It was a bit unclear, so I just might help s simplify it, if I, if I may, through yes, you, Mr. Chair. 
And that is basically most of these uh, were pre-amalgamation. There have been a few since. Not everyone needs to take it up. But what we do need to do is we need to pro um, proactively get a process where we can react quickly for the organisations that need that, this help, all right? So that's exactly what it is. Everything that is done will be legally um, written down and the whole report will come back to finance and performance when we get out of this, this crisis. But we absolutely need to be able to work quickly and effectively and efficiently in reacting to the loans or guarantees request uh, should they all come through. Thank you. Thank you, Desley. That was uh, that was loud and clear. Um, uh, is there anything, uh, uh, Councillor Henderson, you want to add to that? No, oh, no, that's perfect. Yeah, um, it is fairly procedural. Um, so yeah, I voice for it. Okay, I think on on this paper it's it is quite straightforward. Um, maybe we can do questions and comments together. Um, I'll give that a trial, and uh, I, I think. Yeah, if you've read the paper, you'll understand pretty much what it's about. It's not involving a big sum of money, um, but it is necessary to, be able to respond quite quickly, and that's why we need to delegate the authority. So we'll start at the top of the list. Um, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. No questions, no comments. It's all clear. Thank you. Thank you. Count Councillor Bartley. Nothing from me, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Casey. No, I'm all good, Phil. Thank you. Councillor Collins. No, thanks. Councillor Coombe. No questions or comments, thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Cooper. No, I read and understood, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dalton. No questions. Councillor Darby. No, thank you. Councillor Philippine up. All good. Councillor Fletcher. Nothing. Councillor Henderson. Still oh, nothing, Mayor. No, it's still nothing, I've, I've, I've been to you before. Uh, Councillor Hills. Uh, no, nothing for me, straightforward, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Member Kake. So to a Thank you. Councillor Mulholland. No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Newman. Uh, Councillor Newman, are you on the line to us? Might have gone for a cup of tea. Uh, Councillor Sayers. Uh, no questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, we've heard from Councillor Simpson. Councillor Stewart. No, all good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Taipare. Uh, nothing from me, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Walker. All good. Thank you. Councillor Watson. Fine, thanks. Councillor Young. Nothing from me, thank you. Thank you. Well, look, that's excellent. Um, so thank you very much, Lee, for that. And sorry about the, um, the sound quality that you were suffering from there. It's been moved and seconded. I think um, I can take this one on the voices. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Aye. Carried. Thank you very much. Um, now we move um, to um, probably a, a slightly more complex uh, question, but uh, I think we've had some discussion on this already with the uh, public uh, input. Uh, it's the approval, item 10, approval of Auckland Regional Amenities Funding Levy for 2021. I'll just check that I've got... Uh, Josie Muley and Alistair Cameron on the line. Have we got both of you there? Uh, Mr Mayor, it's Alistair here. I'm, I'm here. Okay, and Josie, are you I'm, with us? I'm here, Mr Mayor, but Alistair's leading this report today. Okay, so it's Alistair's fault. We'll come to Alistair in a moment. Um, Councillor Simpson, I'll ask you to move and I'll second um, uh, the approval of the levy. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. And I will second that. And just to uh, reiterate to councillors, um, I did spend quite a lot of uh, the last two days working with members of the amenities board and the funding board uh, to get to a position where this is not an issue as it might have been that uh, would have gone to arbitration and we would have spent uh, tens of thousands of dollars on legal fees. This was a matter resolved by common sense between the amenities board, uh, the funding board um, and Councillor Simpson and myself, uh, where we've reached the position that given the challenges that we face financially and, and, and acknowledging the challenges that the, um, that the amenities themselves have because they've lost income, uh, we have agreed that the most equitable position would be uh, not to increase and not to decrease but simply to maintain uh, through 2020-21 the level of funding we had in the previous year and that uh, contributes uh, 
um, something over a million dollars uh, towards the savings that we need, which might be as high as 250 million. Um, so, um, Alistair, I'll get you to uh, introduce the paper, and uh, you can talk about some of the other aspects of it as well. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look, first of all, the apologies for the lateness of the report getting out. Um, as you've already indicated, there's uh, been a lot of discussion over the last couple of days, and in fact, we only received um, a letter from the chair of the Regional Amenities Funding Board um, last night, sort of confirming that the um, position that we've reached, and I circulated that letter this morning. Just to give a, a bit of background on this, the uh, the Regional Amenities Funding Act allows the nine amenities to apply for funding. Due to the legislation, those um, funding applications were made in October last year when the, the world was quite a different place. So the original um, draft funding plan proposed by the funding board was to ask for funding in the order of $16.7 million which was an increase of uh, 1.2 million or 7.8% uh, from last year. Now, two things have, have happened um, since that draft funding plan was presented to Council. One was, um, as was indicated by the Mayor, the impact of COVID-19 on um, the f finances of both the amenities and Council. And as a result of um, that impact and discussions with the funding board and the amenities, um, there's been an agreement to reduce um, the request um, so to maintain the funding as the current financial year. The second thing that has happened is that um, at a national level, um, the Coast Guard Northern Region has merged with or will merge on the 1st of July with the other regional Coast Guard bodies and Coast Guard New Zealand, so that there will just be one body for all of New Zealand. What that means in terms of um, the Funding Act is that Coast Guard New Zealand is not eligible for funding um, under the legislation. However, um, staff, we're recommending that um, Auckland Council continue to fund Coast Guard New Zealand for an amount equivalent to what the funding board assessed that Coast Guard Northern Region would have required for the coming year. We're proposing that that funding of $824,000 per annum be for a two-year period to allow Coast Guard New Zealand the time to investigate either um, rejoining the RAFA regime, which could either require legislative change or for Auckland Council to invite them um, to change. E either option requires um, time to, um, to sort that out, um, or for a direct, more longer term direct funding arrangement to be entered into with Council. So the net result of those two changes um, is that staff are recommending that funding be provided at the same level um, as was in the current financial year uh, to be made up of um, a $14.68 million contribution um, to a RAFA to distribute to uh, eight amenities now and for $824,000 per annum be provided to um, Coast Guard New Zealand. Look, I think I'd just like to, to say that um, there's been a lot of sort of constructive dialogue um, with the RAFA board and the amenities. We acknowledge that um, the financial impact of COVID-19 on the amenities, is, uh, they're going to be hit pretty hard, um, as has Auckland Council, but I think that the outcome is prudent, responsible and pragmatic on, on all parties' behalf. Uh, happy to take questions. Uh Thank you very much uh, for that, Alistair. Um, I think we could probably on this paper um, run questions and comments together as well. Um, this, this paper might have been much more difficult, uh, but for the readiness of the Amenities Board and uh, Matt Williams and, uh, and the, the Funding uh, Board, uh, Anita Colleen, um, to be really understanding of council's position and to be cooperative in saying 
we're all in this. Uh, we all face, you know, challenges. Um, but this is our contribution, uh, and 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 not to try to force it through a, a legal channel. And uh, I really appreciate that. I had some really good conversations uh, across the board with different amenities and uh, members of the funding board. And I think we've got to a, a very good uh, position. Um, but perhaps if um, if we do comments and questions to together, and perhaps if I can start with the chair of the the finance committee, uh, Councillor Desley Simpson. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Well, having moved it, uh, I think everyone's pretty clear where I sit in it. I, I want to add to your thanks for, to the amenities and the funding board for their understanding of the extraordinary circumstances Council finds itself in as a result of COVID-19, and I think we're all in a good place. I want to remind councillors that there are some legal obligations around this. Um, they could have, they could have asked for a lot more. So I think everybody, both the amenities themselves, both boards, etc., need a, a, a huge, a, 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 you know, a, a note back thanking them, to be honest, if this goes through. Your Worship would, wouldn't at all be inappropriate. No, I'd be very happy to take up that advice. OK, let's, uh, let's run through our list again. Um, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Desley. I, I quite agree with Desley. A note of appreciation for the um, funding board and the management board's attitudes towards our circumstances currently would be highly appropriate. It is good to see that there's a degree of collaboration in this area. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. And it won't have escaped anybody's attention that we'll also next be dealing with the museums, and they have similar arbitration provisions if they were to insist on them. But I think a, a very good precedent has been set by the Amenities Board and the Amenities Funding Board, and we would hope that across the board, uh, we can endeavour to meet our savings targets, given our huge loss of revenue, um, by this sort of cooperative and collaborative approach. Uh, Councillor Josephine Bartley. Um, thank you, Ms. Men. Uh, nothing from me, just to thank yourself and uh, Councillor Simpson and the ARAFA board members for getting to this stage. Thank you, Councillor. Much appreciated. Uh, Councillor Cathy Casey. I'd just like to echo my thanks, but also, Alistair, I think I read in Anita Colleen's letter that the board have also said that they will freeze their current rates of remuneration. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, well, that's to be noted as well, and any note of thanks, it's, um, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I think that, uh, you know, the spirit of people Understanding the reality of the crisis that we're in and cooperating towards it is something that we can be really proud of. Um, Councillor Collins. None from me, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Coon. No uh, questions or comments, but just to add my thanks as well for the work that's gone on behind the scenes to get this to a sensible place. Kia ora. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Um, kia ora. Um, I think... What this shows is, um, you know, we've been asked by our ratepayers to decrease the rates take, and this is outside the um, average rates take that we do, and this will make a difference for people with their decreased income. So I really applaud the RAFA board for um, realising that and coming to the party. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dalton. Yeah, just well done to everyone. I'm really impressed. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Councillor Darby? Yeah, similarly, acknowledging the RIFA board back then. Thank you. Councillor Filipina? Just acknowledge your work in the RIFA board, but uh, uh, Your Worship, I think it's important that the comms that go out about this, um, the people are acknowledged in regards to uh, where we've come to. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good idea. The letter of thanks and um, the comms to say this is the spirit in which we intend to tackle the, the, the deficit that's been created by a, a major loss of revenue. Um, I, th I think it's, um, it, it sets a standard and we should all follow it. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Chris Fletcher. Nothing, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Henderson. Yeah, thanks. I just want to echo uh, my thanks to the RAFA board, uh, to staff, but also to acknowledge your hard work as well, Councillor Simpson. I know you worked a lot on this as well. So, um, yeah, thanks, everybody, and delighted we can get here. Thanks, Mr Deputy. Thank you. And Councillor Hills. Kia ora. No, this is a really good outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Member Kake. As a recipient of the services alike, um, you have my support. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Mulholland. Uh, kia ora, um, <coughs> Mr Mayor. And to all, it just shows how working together in collaboration can get a good outcome. So thank you also to Councillor Simpson for her work on this as well. Kia ora. Thank you very much. Councillor Newman. Uh, yes, a, a couple of uh, I have one question from me, um, and thank you to the officers for the work that's, that's taken place here. Uh, with respect to the specified amenities, um, I think the uh, Auckland Rescue Helicopter Trust in particular has been very successful for a number of years in being able to organise um, sponsorship uh, to, to cover its costs and it really has been a bit of a standout in terms of being able to wipe its face by comparison. But I think I think moving forward, um, they, they're going to be in quite a marginal position. So I'm anticipating that, that their call on, on uh, as a specified amenity uh, relative to the other amenities who have been um, recipients of, of very large sums of money here for quite some time, the, the Rescue Helicopter Trust position could change to the point where they too need to to really get an increase in the quantum of funding. What work, work is being done with the trust to ensure that um, um, you know that, that the support can be signalled moving forward? Because I just don't believe that by in 12 months' time that things are going to be able to turn around for them. Um, thank you for that. I did talk to the acting CEO uh, of the Helicopter Trust, uh, Michelle Bogue, yesterday. had quite a long uh, conversation with Michelle. Uh, she understood the position that Council was in. Uh, like the other members of the um, amenities board that I talked to, um, they've all got a, a story to tell. The services they provide are valuable to us. Um, the access that they'll have to other bodies like, um, you know, the Lotteries Board, uh, Foundation North, etc. Um, that that's going to take a blow. Uh, and for some of those organisations, the fact that they can't, you know, they can't go out and hold public events like the APO or, or Opera, um, they're going to take an even bigger blow. So um, really to acknowledge, I mean, it's, it, Certainly the Helicopter Trust will, will suffer, but as uh, uh, Ms Bogue said to me, um, you know, they rely less on, on council than some of the other bodies in terms of their total funding. Um, but we should not diminish in any way the difficulties that each of these organisations will face, but they equally were gracious enough to acknowledge the difficulties we were facing and saying, well, look, this is no time for us to go, go for an increase. But those conversations, Councillor, will recommence um, a year hence when we've got a better idea of what our financial position is and a better idea of the position each of the amenities uh, groups uh, will be in at that point. Yeah, uh, look, I... I, I Absolutely acknowledge that. Um, I guess the point that I'm making is that the trust really hasn't been one that's that, that's uh, had a proportionately um, well had had as significant a call on this particular regional funding as some of the others in years past. That's fine. Um, they're not making a call this year, but I would imagine that. Um, next year it's going to get really, really tough for them as well, and so their call might be proportionate to the others. And I guess we'll have the debate then, but I, can, I can't imagine that they will be as successful in the immediate future in terms of their commercial fundraising as they have been previously, because they've been more successful than most. But I'm not sure that that's going to be the way forward for them in the immediate future. Yeah, I think everybody will suffer in that way. Uh, thank you for making that point. Um, we now come to Councillor Greg Sayers. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd just like to quickly add my voice uh, to um, thank and acknowledge the Auckland Regional Amenities Funding Board. Um, also, I, I want to give a special thanks and acknowledgement for the hard work done by the Chair of the Finance Committee, Councillor Simpson. Also to yourself, Your Worship, for the work that you've done and also as to um, all the council officers that have been involved to get this across the line. So well done and happy to support the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Stewart. No, thank you. Um, Chair Taipere. Uh, no comments, thanks. Uh, Councillor Walker. No comment. Thank you. Councillor Watson. Um, yes, just um, my acknowledgement is, is of the 
the pragmatic response the board have, have taken. Um, I think there'll be a lot of other organisations that will be wishing that they were in a position to do likewise, actually, if we're going to be honest about um, things. And as um, someone else remarked, a good precedent for Auckland Council of uh, making do with what they had last year. So um, I think it's, uh, it's a pragmatic response, and I acknowledge that. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Young. Paul, have we got you on the line? Okay. Thanks, Le Paul and everyone. Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor. Much appreciated. And thank, uh, thank you to, um, to everybody on the Emergency Committee for um, your, your positive comments. Uh, they were much appreciated. Uh, you wish, excuse me, just before you take it to the vote, I just wondered if you would entertain, because I'd like to put up a D, that a letter of thanks go to the appropriate um, bodies, because... Um, we haven't actually said that. Everyone's mentioned it in their comments, and to be honest, I was probably pretty remiss not having it in the first place. Would you support that? Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely a seconder. I'd um, support that. So it would be something like... Um, request that request, a letter go to... Uh, a letter sorry. of thanks be sent to the... Uh, the regional amen uh, to the amenities board and the amenities funding board uh, for their... Um, their uh, cooperation and assistance in reaching this outcome. Does that yeah. sound right? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, even the amenities themselves, to be honest, as well. Um, to, well to, maybe we could say to members of the, the, the amenity board and its members hmm. and to the, um, the, the funding board. That would then encompass everyone, I think. Yeah. So I'm just letting Sandra type that up, probably seeing that coming on your screen at the moment. Uh, and its members and the amenities funding Yep, that's that, that's excellent. So um, I think I can do this without a division. Sent um, to the amenities. Sorry, I'm just getting a grammar right, but yes. Be, be sent to. Yes, sorry, you're right. Um, right, I think we're we're grammatically and um, and uh, other otherwise uh, accurate now on on this. Um, so I'll just take it on the voices. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, aye. no. And can I declare that carried unanimously? Uh, thank you very much. I think yes. that's that's well, a then, that's a, a really really good outcome. Um, we come now to um, item number eleven, uh, which is uh, really a, a, um, a open process report. Um, so um, maybe if um, I move it, I, can I ask for a seconder on that? I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Um, and I'm imagining that uh, questions and comments can be held over for the item under, under C1 on that. Um, so if there's no objection, I'll, I'll simply put that, uh, I'll put the vote on that. All those on, in favour, please say aye. 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 To the aye. contrary, no. Carried. Um, now we come uh, to item number 12, which is consideration uh, of extraordinary business and this relates to the appointment of a group recovery manager for COVID-19 and the motion on the screen is to appoint um, Phil Wilson to that position um, to add to his already considerable workload. Thank you, thank you for that Phil. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy uh, to, to move that again. Can I have uh, somebody second it? Efeso, thank you. Um, seconded by uh, Councillor Efeso Collins. And uh, if I can ask, I think Kate Crawford, you're back on the line with us, Kate? No. Um, so um, maybe, maybe I'm going to ask if it's in order, uh, Phil Wilson, just to, exp since he is the focal point of the resolution, uh, to outline um, why this position is necessary and the sort of role and responsibility that he'll have. Audio quality. Okay, I'm sorry, my quality is, is not good there. Um, not sure what's going on there. Usually it's, uh, it's quite good at this end. So what I've, what I've done is asked uh, Phil Wilson uh, to speak to the paper. Uh, Phil. Uh, we're, we've got gremlins in the system and uh, Phil's um, having trouble getting in. Um, as you will have seen from the, the paper, which um, 
uh, I think everybody received as a, as a late paper. Um, the requirement is to appoint a group recovery manager uh, for COVID-19. And usually at the end of a, a process um, involving uh, CDM, uh, we do that. Um, it's the, the position uh, is to uh, deal with the recovery phase. And it won't be that the crisis phase and the recovery phase are two separate and distinct things. Uh, they'll run together, but we certainly need somebody to, to take um, the responsibility and fulfill the role of leading us uh, out of the crisis and through the recovery phase. And I think Phil's got his uh, uh, audio back. So um, I'll ask you to elaborate further on that, Phil. Thanks, Your Worship. Yes, this is this is largely procedural. Um, just need to formalise this matter um, through the Emergency Committee, acting on behalf of the um, Group Civil Defence Committee. Um, um, to the Mayor's point, yes, um, the recovery phase is is um, significantly directed by the, the um, national coordination effort. Um, um, it would mean that I work closely with Kate and others in Auckland Emergency Management on the recovery phase. Um, the recovery phase itself is potentially quite long term. Um, it sort of differs from what you might normally expect in terms of activity um, post-emergency once um, threat to life and property is, is dealt with. Um, obviously, councillors are aware of the the social, economic, um, and so on implications of this for a longer time frame. So it's it's a good solution, uh, we suggest, um, to have the Auckland Emergency Management formal effort well tied in with council and other agencies in terms of what this means for the community. So um, um, I'm not going to speak in my own favour in terms of the appointment. Um, you can form your own view quietly on that. Thank you, Your Worship. Hello. Sorry, my mic is off, so probably I've got to start that all again. Um, Okay, it is a requirement uh, under under Section 29 of the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act that each uh, CDM group appoint uh, a person, a suitably qualified and experienced person, to be group recovery manager. And uh, all of us know Phil well enough uh, to know that he has considerable experience, uh, having been a governance director since uh, 2015 and before that chief of staff in the mayor's office and before that in Monaco uh, Council, uh, that he has the skills uh, to carry out uh, the responsibilities and the role in this area um, uh, in an exemplary manner. So um, I'm not sure that I'll, I'll go uh, through the list, but I'll just ask um, if anybody has a question or a comment that they would like to make. It's quite straightforward. But if you could please indicate um, by taking a call uh, orally uh, and giving your name, and uh, we'll, we'll run questions and comments together if there are any of either. Yeah, me, Phil. Uh, Kathy Casey. Councillor Casey. Phil Wilson does an extraordinary job in many roles at the moment. Does that mean he's shifting from those roles to do this other one? Uh, though it largely means that he's working twice the hours for the same pay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the, you for that clarification, Mr Mayor. The, the grimace uh, on, on Phil's face indicates that I've probably, uh, I've probably got it right. Uh, <laughs> any, uh, thank you, Councillor Casey. Um, any, any further questions or comments? If Chris not, Darby, Mayor? Uh, yeah, Councillor Darby. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phil. Phil, um, about five weeks ago, I talked to the Director of Strategy about implementing a strategic uh, response um, to COVID and some initial work is being undertaken. Do I take it that the Director of Strategy retains that oversight and lead along with the Planning Committee for the strategic response to COVID?
Sorry, Phil's just trying to get his uh, audio right. Are you uh, are you on air now? I am. New yep. new technology for me. Um, uh, yes, and I would be working closely with Megan in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any further questions or comments? Uh, from me, Phil. Uh, Councillor Philippina. Thank you. Uh, question uh, to Phil W. Um, Phil, I know that um, Claudia has, has, is doing some work with her team around what things will look like post um, the lockdown uh, and to our levels. Is, is, is that still a piece of work um, um, based on what Chris is saying, that, that all the committees and groups are doing? Yes, um, I, what, you've, what we need to do is um, envisage this as quite a broad, coordinated effort, not just within council and, and the executive team within council and, and Claudia in particular is working actively on planning around l level three, level two, level one and post this um, uh, lockdown situation entirely. So. We will be working closely together. Um, what Claudia is doing is uh, hugely relevant because it goes to the planning of council's uh, services for the longer term. Um, so to our coordination with other agencies and service delivery in the city. Thank you. Uh, any further questions or comments? Councillor Philippina? Just had the comment. So um, Phil, congratulations and um, I have no doubt at all uh, that the people sitting around the emergency committee will be there to assist. So congratulations. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor. Any further questions or comments? Uh, Richard. Uh, Councillor Hills. Uh, yeah, just a quick comment. Uh, uh, good appointment, good role for Phil and his relationship across the uh, business, but also with both uh, councillors, IMSB and uh, local board members will uh, mean this quite a perfect uh, person for the role as well, so thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any further comments, questions? If not, um, the motion has been moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Collins, which is to appoint Phil Wilson uh, to the role of Group Recovery Manager COVID-19, uh, and that will, that will be a, a specific role for a specific period of time. All of us would really love to know how long a period of time that would be. Um, I'll put the resolution on the voices, if that's okay. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 To, aye. To, the to the contrary, no. Uh, I declare it carried. Um, we come now to the resolution um, to exclude the public um, from the consideration of item C1 uh, on the basis that this contains information and confidence uh, from our CCOs and information concerning uh, financial risks, cyber and information security risks. Uh, could I have a seconder for that motion, please? I'll second it, boss. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Um, uh, I'll move that resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Um, now, councillors, I, I'm going to recommend we just take a uh, maybe a, a five-minute break because uh, it, it's the last item on the agenda. It's not necessarily uh, one that will take a, a prolonged period of time. But we do have immediately after that a, a confidential financial update from uh, Kevin Ramsey, the acting group um, chief financial officer on where we're at um, with the process of uh, tackling the challenges we face on finances and uh, getting the annual uh, plan finalised. Um, so that will that will take that will take a little longer. Um, can I just ask Sandra to give advice now because we come back in not under this um, uh, this particular channel but a separate confidential channel on Skype? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, councillors, can I please get you to hang up from your...